In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the mysteries of the Church, my thoughts mystically pondered. And I desire to reveal the thought of the heart by the speech of the mouth. By the speech of the mouth, I desire to tell of their greatness, and with words to depict an image of their glory. Upon their glory, my mind gazed narrowly, but dread seized upon me and left me motionless. I stood still, for I was disturbed, and I began to cry out. I gave woe to myself, and with fear I turned back. The Spirit, by his beckoning, encouraged me to enter the Holy of Holies and to the Holy of Holies of the glorious mysteries, that I might reveal the beauty of their glory to the sons of the mystery. Hear then the mystery that is explained to you. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our minds today as we delve deep into the nature of the gift you've given us, which is the spirit of our church, the Church of the East. Help us to understand, appreciate the fine-tuning and intentionality you've given us so that we can appreciate you deeper and love you more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we'll start on page 30 on our books that are great accompaniments for us. And uh, we did finish last week by kind of finishing up looking at evening prayer, Ramsha. And so we kind of got the idea of what Ramsha is trying to do because there wasn't a daily Mass, is to spread out the Eucharist throughout the week through these different prayers. So it's almost like a huge um, spiritual communion. You know, you're really making the grace of the mystery of salvation present through these prayers. So we're going to go into page 30 and just have a general um, comment um, and look through this top of this page. According to the genius of the Liturgy of the Church of the East, this part of Ramsha symbolically reenacts the remaining phases of the mystery of Christ, i.e. the private and public life of our Lord. You know, I believe this was already um, read over, so we're going to skip this. Okay, we read over this last week. Um, but in essence, it's just reaffirming what, I, reaffirming what I just said. It makes present the Eucharist through these prayers. Okay? Uh, so next we're going to go over the meaning of the structure of Lydia. Lydia means night prayer. And with that, uh, it's going to be a brief overview. As you can see, it's only half a page. And it just lays out the order of it, just so you could see the order of another uh, hour of prayer. So Lydia's night prayer. And it starts with just like most of the sacraments do and most of the hours do. We go to the Lord's Prayer. Then there are a series of psalms. Then there's like the main prayer for that specific night prayer of that season of the church that it falls under. Uh, there is a psalm of praise. Then a hymn of praise. There's a, a apostle of Paul's letter, the epistle. There is the... Um, Petitions, the Karozutha, that we call the proclamation prayer, and then the final blessing. So kind of final blessing, sort of not. Um, let's look at this. Note that night prayer begins with the angel's hymn, just like evening prayer does, just like mass does, and the Lord's prayer. But morning prayer, if you look at the next page, does not begin with glory to God in the highest. It does not. In addition, night prayer does not contain a hutama, which is the final blessing. This is weird. So, night prayer starts with the, the beginning, how it should be starting, but it, it does not have an ending final blessing, while morning prayer does. Hmm. Instead, night prayer ends with, let us pray, peace be with us. This indicates the ancient practice of this tradition of celebrating night and morning, Lilia Sapra, together. So, um, continuing, today night prayer is typically prayed before rest, and at dawn, one would rise from their sleep for morning prayer. So when I was uh, in Australia, sometimes we would pray elements of night prayer in the morning, before the morning mass, and then we would pray morning prayer, because there is a start and there is a closing uh, final blessing. So they would kind of combine them, probably so they can sleep more. <laughs> But also, my own speculation is because the monks would pray all the hours, but for the, the diocesan priests, they weren't required to. They were called to pray morning, evening, and night. And so it would just be for practical purposes. 
simpler to combine them, put them together. Okay, that's, that's the logic behind that. We're not going to spend too much time on this. It's just to point out some of the traditions, okay? Uh, this is not going to be the focus of the lecture. We're going to move forward. The structure of morning prayer looks like this. There's kind of like an opening prayer, but it's not really. It's just a regular prayer. There's psalms of the morning, lots of psalms. Then there's the specific prayer for that morning. This is for Sundays, for that week of the church. Then there's the um, Madnahai Sapra, which is like prayed uh, a solemn prayer in the morning, uh, every single morning, actually. There's the hymns of light. We do that in St. Thomas. Those are written by St. Ephraim and St. Narse, the first half by St. Ephraim, the second half by Narse. Uh, there's Bar Kulla, bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord, from Daniel chapter 3. There's the glory to God in the highest prayer, which is written by St. Theodore of Mopsuestia. We call him saint, but he's considered a heretic. All right, so we're not going to talk about that. He's the teacher of Nestorius. He's Nestorius' teacher. So he wrote uh, the last prayer that we pray typically in morning prayer before Mass. But if we don't have Mass, morning prayer ends with these concluding prayers and a final blessing. For a daily morning prayer, you can just look through that yourself. At the end, we'll just say most of the prayers of morning prayer express sentiments of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord of creation and light. Because when the morning time is in the light, is revealing, right? Uh, so morning prayer is sometimes combined with the first part of the Khurbana. So at St. George Church back in the day, I think they might still do this. We did morning prayer before the first Mass on the side. And then we would do the glory to God, the front and center, and all stand in the middle facing the altar. And then the priest would be gone, changing to robe, and he would walk in and continue the prayer into Mass with a seamless transition. It's very interesting. That's the intentionality of how, morning, how Mass is supposed to start on Monday, Sunday morning. It's supposed to be transitioning seamlessly from morning prayer. Isn't that interesting? Morning prayer starts from the Old Testament, right? The Psalms. And then Mass comes in and continues it seamlessly. So with that being said, we're going to go to the Mass. Woo! All right. So we'll go to page 32 and 33. Lots of comments before we jump in. First, <laughs> first comment. In the Chaldean church, the frequency of the mass changing is taking place at an alarming rate, especially to the degree that it's changing and the lack of consistency that's taking place. At an academic level, it's very alarming and concerning to see how much inconsistency there is across the board in the church through different bishops, although there are seemingly agreements. Uh, I myself, not to sow any seeds of concern, I myself have not seen any documents from the Vatican that approved some of these recent masses, although I've seen documents from our patriarch, but it just makes me um, uneasy at how quickly the mass is being changed at the rate that it's changing and how it um, seems to be that they're still not done. So that's my first um, academic critique. Okay, I'll say that in an objective way, not to start to stand on a soapbox. I think any basic, early level beginner liturgist would even see what I just said. Anyone in the level of caring for liturgy or studying liturgy can see what I just said. That's a, that's a comment and a, contra and, a, and a critique as well of my own church. Uh, then, um, I do want to comment. So what is this version of the Mass that we're going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at not what we look at today, currently, in the Chaldean Church. We're not going to look at that Mass, brothers and sisters. We're going to look at, you see on page 32, the following version of the Mass is from the 1975-1976 edition, which was edited by Father Toma Hanona from the Archdiocese of Mosul, and accepted by Patriarch the Second Paul Paul the Second Shechu. That Mass, it says it's an edited Mass. That Mass which Father Hanuna edited was formally promulgated by Patriarch Yusuf the Sixth Emmanuel the Second Thomas in 1901. And this was like before the genocide took place. So he was doing a lot. This bishop, or this Patriarch rather. So that's the 1901. That's kind of like when this Mass became more um, 
concretized, we'll say. Okay? Now, um, just I had to find the place to say this, and it's very important for us to know that what's fundamental when you approach our Mass to understand the approach and the mental direction you should be facing. The way that the Mass is crafted. It's very, every single uh, act is intentional. Every single point is intentional. That being said, I had to find a place to say this, and I think this is a good time before we go into the Mass. I'm going to read to you um, what Pope Benedict says on the Mass, okay? If you can hear screaming in the background, I know this is a church, but that's our middle school girls program, and they're just having fun right now. Okay, so he says in his book, Feast of Faith, pages 67 to 68, Ratzinger against homemade liturgy. It is also, oh, you, you always don't have this in your notes. You don't have this in your notes, sorry. I had to add this up. I added this later, it's supplemental. It is also worth observing here that the creativity, he quotes, involved in manufactured liturgies has a very restricted scope. It is poor indeed compared with the wealth of the received liturgy in its hundreds and thousands of years of history. Unfortunately, the originators of homemade liturgies are slower to become aware of this than the participants. So he's first critiquing people who keep on making their personal changes in the Mass. He's saying, you don't know what you're doing. Stop changing the Mass so easily. And then he says this. Now, this is the really important part. This is from his book, Spirit of the Liturgy. Excellent book. For anyone who wants to study liturgy, you, you look into this book, Spirit of the Liturgy. Page 80. Pope Benedict says, The turning of the priest toward the people has turned the community into a self-enclosed circle. In its outward form, it no longer opens out on what lies ahead and above, but is locked into itself. The common turning toward the east was not a celebration toward the wall. It did not mean that the priest had his back to the people, he writes. The priest himself was not regarded as so important. For just as the congregation in the synagogue looked toward Jerusalem together, so in the Christian liturgy, the congregation looked together toward the Lord. So, what you should be understanding from that is that the intentionality of Mass in general, and this is coming from a Pope that heralds from the Western tradition, is that we face East. And he's Pope Benedict, extraordinary mind, one of the greatest minds of the church, uh, strongly critiques the modern day movement of facing the people during Mass. Now, does that mean that, like, when I preach to you, I should be facing the wall? No, I'm facing you. But the offering sacramentally is you're praying through the mediator. Mediator has approached, through his mediation, mediating peace may increase among you. So mediating. You're praying your prayers through the priest who takes it to the Lord, to the Father, who represents Christ, who takes it to the Father. Okay. So that's really important to understand before we jump into the Mass. The intentionality is to face the East. Okay? And especially when it comes to the Church of the East. Everything you see when we're going to look at rubrics, which you've never seen some of these rubrics before, most of them you've never seen, they're all formulated with the intention of the Understanding that the priest is facing the cross, the east. Typically, the, you know, we talked about the first day, how the structure of the church should look. This direction should be east. And you talk about the structure of the church. Okay, so if it's not for practical purposes, which in this church, that's south, that's east. So we, at least we face the cross. Okay, that's the second like, best thing to do. Clear on that? Great. So, let's look at the top of page 33. The priest vests with the sacred vestments and descends before the altar. He bows before the cross and begins. 
So we, here we have the ceremonial entrance, right? There's the, this is the first half, or the first part of the Mass, we'll call it. This is like what we can call the instructional section. The instructional section ends at the end of petitions. Because all of that is just kind of like, we're breaking open the Word of God, we're meditating on the epistle, we're hearing a homily, we're presenting our petitions. We didn't focus on the sacrifice yet. That's the second half of the Mass, which is the Eucharistic section. So there's the instructional section and the Eucharistic section. In other words, the Word of God and the Eucharist. Right, those are the two parts of the Mass. Um, so the instructional section starts with the glorious and ceremonial entrance, starting off where morning prayer just ended. We just went over that. The Psalms are read, ending with Hallelujah, 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 and the Lord's Prayer with the Qaddish refrain. Okay, great. So at the end of morning prayer, there's the, that whole Our Father prayer, and then you just transition right in. Uh, to the Mass. So the first line, you see uh, all these prayers or notes of the Mass, including the rubrics, will be enabled with numbers. You see that? Number one is the first part that we speak in the Mass. The priest says, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and good hope to all forever. And uh, the first thing for us to note is that according to the spirituality of the Church of the East, we focus on glorifying God first. That is the primary um, priority. The Roman Catholic Church, they say, brothers and sisters, let us turn towards our hearts and look and dis consider our sins. You know, that's how they start. But we start with glorifying God first before we focus on ourselves. Because that's just a difference of approach. It's worthy of note. Uh, this prayer, as mentioned before, is the prayer of the angels. And I will ask you, what angels prayer am I referring to? Not St. Michael, the Archangel. Which, which one, though? No. The shepherds. The angels came to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. You can see it here, Luke 2, 14. And, and they said, oh, glory to God in the highest. You know, we bring you good news of great joy for all the earth. That Christ has been born. You know? A baby has been born as Christ the Lord. So, historically speaking, that's what happens after the Old Testament. <laughs> That's like one of the first things that happened. So you see we're going in a chronological, generally in a chronological order. And the way that this Mass is so geniusly crafted is to intentionally aid the people who are praying so that they can follow along with the movements of salvation history and make it personally present to them. Because as you know, now, this is also important to say, now we're not focusing like on the liturgical year. We're just thinking about these certain different moments of salvation history. We're not focusing on evening prayer, but we're just thinking about, in a greater detail, these moments of salvation history. Now we're at the heart of the target. We're at bullseye. And bullseye is not empty. It's solid red. We're actually in the heart of the matter. We're dealing with it itself. We're going and diving in, into God's time, not our time, so all these things are truly present to us, like the angel saying his prayer. In a mystical way, we're present with the angels. We're present with the shepherds. It's extraordinary theology. It's extraordinary, because you're not in earthly time. You're in God's time. Extraordinary theology. Okay. So if you're bored during Mass, then you are a boring person. <laughs> okay. So the first prayer is a praise of God, which is proper to the spirituality of the Mass of the Church of the East. In addition, the angel's proclamation is a fulfillment of the Old Testament, of which now we may begin to move forward from the Psalms of the Old Testament, which will now only partially be present as antiphons in various prayers. We enter the New Testament. Yay! The New Testament starts with the birth of Christ, as does the Mass. Okay, the common way of the Chaldean fathers and the uh, Chaldean and Assyrian fathers uh, to interpret the Mass is a movement throughout the life of Christ. Mass is a continuation of salvation history, as mentioned, starting with the New Testament, which starts with the birth of Christ. So we'll be following that, as I mentioned. Number two, the Our Father is said. There's an interjection of the priest, glory be to the Father. Number four, Our Father is... Um, 
responsorial our father continues in number four and the priest ends it so where did that come from um obviously the our father is from the bible so matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13 uh, but Timothy the first from 780 to 823 AD, he was a um, patriarch or he's alive, the Lord's Prayer with its responsorial Kaddish was introduced at the beginning and at the end of all services and soon after found its place in the very opening of the Mass. Okay? So he's the one who added that. And at the time we prayed the Our Father at the beginning of Mass, in the middle, near the end, and then at the end. Those three times that it was prayed, and the idea of that was because you were usually celebrating Mass in a place where you weren't allowed to publicize catechism classes because you'll probably be killed because you're religiously, religiously being persecuted all the time. So we made these points to, one, catechize the faithful, so they really know that Our Father is an important prayer. We say it three times. It's a point of catechesis. Number two, um, it's also because three is a holy number. It's oftentimes used as a as a point in the Mass of things are repeated three times, so the holiness of that number. Number six, let us pray peace be with us. So what is the purpose of that line? We hear that all the time. This line refers to when there is a movement from one subsection to another within the greater whole of a section. So if there's a section of the Mass, and they say, let us pray peace be with us, you're moving from one point of that section to another point of that section. Now, if you move from a whole section to another section, we say, peace be with us. That's the purpose of that. So we're staying within the same part of the Mass when you say, let us pray peace be with us, and you get the idea. Uh, so when, when only peace be with us is used, it usually refers to a movement from one whole section to another. Uh, we've mentioned this before, but Mass used to be offered in houses, page, top to page 35. And so um, I've heard said by Bishop Sarhad Jammu that the phrase, uh, peace be with us, is also... Uh, a manner of calming and quieting the people down because when you start mass at someone's house, you know, have you ever tried to get a Chaldean's attention? You know, when there's a group of Chaldeans, you're not going to do it. So the key phrase was, Shlama Amman, Shlama, like, you know, Shlama Amman, peace be with us, like, quiet down, we're going to start mass. So that was something that I thought was interesting to, mo to know on here. So the first... Um, uh, movement that takes place is the prayer before the marmitha, which is a psalmody. And the priest says this prayer. Strengthen our Lord and our God, our weakness by your mercy. Now when he says our weakness, he's not talking about our weakness. He's talking about himself and the other priests who are present. This is the clerical prayer. That we may celebrate the holy mysteries do you say that the people celebrate Mass? Who celebrates the Mass? The priest. So it's a pro clero on behalf of the priest. That's how that means in Latin. Um, why? As in the Old Testament theology, when the high priest goes to offer the sacrifice on behalf of the people, first he has to offer it on behalf of himself. Because he's a sinner. So he, the first prayer that the priest says is strengthen our Lord our God, our weakness by mercy, that we may celebrate the holy mysteries. I'm about to do this. For strength in me, Lord. And that's usually how the, the ordinations take place too. The bishop says prayers like this, and he's saying strength in me so that I can strengthen this person. Very interesting formula. It's consistent through our, our liturgies. Okay. Which have been given to us for our renewal and redemption of our weak nature. Uh, through the mercy of your beloved Son, O Lord of all forever. Beautiful. Okay. So the, another thing to note here about the spirituality of our church and our people is that we constantly beseech God's mercy. And the idea behind that is this is just um, a, a great awareness that we have of the need of God's mercy to be able to approach him. So we have this super hyper awareness that you can't do anything without his mercy, especially when it comes to the Mass. So you guys notice an opening prayer that one prayer we read every single week, written by Martin Arce, he was literally going to comment. He was writing a commentary on the Mass, and he stopped. He said, I'm not worthy. He got afraid, because he realized how this is such a powerful uh, prayer that's beyond him. 
that you can't quantify this. You can't comment on this. It's so mysterious. It's so beyond our comprehension that only by the grace of God can you approach it. He said, by the Spirit, by its beckoning, you know, call me to the holy mysteries, the holy of holies. So only because the Spirit is leading me on to go is the only reason I can go forward. Beautiful. That's why I love that as an opening prayer. It really encapsulates our spirits, what we should be focusing on. Amen. <laughs> Number eight. Great. And then they begin the Marmitha. So before 600 AD, the monastic psalmody gradually established itself as a practical way to fill the waiting time immediately before the beginning of the ceremony, making its last two verses, aqafta, that's what that means, as the official acclamation to start the solemn mass. So uh, the last two verses would be sung. Uh, there's like a chant that most of us here don't know, but I know, but some of you do know, I'm sure. Uh, but it kind of matches the chant of Or like the priest would say like one of the endings of a psalm. That's usually that one I just said is for high feast days. Uh, who would say like uh, uh, a different psalm and at the end who would be like Dayana Britha Kenuta Alleluia Same chant. So it's just saying, the last two lines are chanted. That's all it's saying. Okay. Uh, and that's an official way to proclamate the psalm, start of the psalm mass. Okay. With Isha Yab III, a standard structure and text were organized and adopted for different seasons of the church, not only for the common or fixed elements of the mass, but also for the variable and proper pieces. Hallelujah, hallelujah, eh, hallelujah. What does hallelujah mean? It comes from the Hebrew root of the word hallel, which is to praise. So the word means El El, El is God. You know, Elijah, the Lord is God. El is God. Elohim. So the word means praise God. It's also where we get the famous El Hola from. You know, the jubilation. It's a joy, joyful shout. If I did a good job, please write in the comments below. Okay. Uh, number 10. The deacon says, let us pray, peace be with us. Notice the word deacon. Ordained people would be serving the Mass. Not subdeacons, not regular servers. This would be a deacon's part. And there were so many, you know, that it wasn't an issue of how can we find some. But the danger is now, I notice many people will call themselves deacons. That's the answer. You're not a deacon. You're not a deaconess. You're not a subdeacon unless you were, you know, minor ordination, minor orders, given that blessing, but you're not a deacon. So we say the word shamasha all the time. They're not shamasha. They're hopid yakna. That's the technical word, which is Greek for hyperdeacon. It's a Greek word. <laughs> hopid yakna. Say that 20 times. Um, but we just say shamasha, which is very confusing because they're not shamasha. Technically, they're, the shamasha literally means deacon. Okay. Find etymology. I don't know if you guys are into etymology. I love etymology. I love it. <sighs> okay. <laughs> In the older days, the priest would not have ascended to the altar just yet. So, as you notice today, I'm standing here. Okay. No. We wouldn't have gone up to the altar. So, the priest started sitting at the chair, presider's chair, uh, probably about six or seven years ago. But before that, the beginning of Mass would just take place behind the altar. Like La Humara and stuff, the priest would just stand behind the altar. So that's why that note is here. The priest would not have ascended the altar yet. He should not be doing that. In fact, he would wait until the creed or even until the gifts are brought up, arguably, the priest would have been in the Bama at this point. The priest would have been in the Bama. So, prayer before the apse, the antiphon of the apse. Look at the image you have there. What do you see there? Cherubim and the seraphim, right? What's in the center? The garments of Jesus. What's that in reference to? What are the garments sitting there in reference to? The resurrection, right? The empty tube. And then, what is it laid upon, those garments? A chair, a throne. And so, I love this image. I found this image myself and um, online. 
uh, because the main two images, actually we'll look at the top of page 37. The altar is most certainly the center of attraction of the church. It is both spiritually seen as the throne of God and the tomb of Christ. So that picture captures both of those, which I think is awesome because that's uh, central to how we view the altar. Beautiful. All right, so let's look at prayer number 11 that we have removed, unfortunately, from the Mass. You usually have not seen this in the English Mass, actually. It's always said in the High Mass, but even then, it's completely gone now. This prayer does not exist in any of our Masses anymore. Okay, but it's a very beautiful prayer. So before the magnificent throne of your glory, we already call the altar his throne. O oh Lord, the exalted and sublime seat of your majesty, the revered Bama of your intense love, the absolving altar which you have erected and the place in which your glory dwells, we, your people, and the sheep of your fold, along with the innumerable cherubim that praise you, and with the multitude of seraphim and archangels that glorify you, we adore prostrate. And at this time when the priest says prostrate, another word is kneel, barakinan, I think I should say kneel, technically. Barakinan means kneel. And the priest kneels, and everybody in the church kneels on one knee. He pauses for a moment, and then he says, Sardinan, and then he stands up, and everyone else stands up. It's like recognizing the holiness of the altar. We all kneel before it. Isn't that beautiful? I don't know. It's so sad that this is not in the Mass. All right. At all times, the Lord of all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. So this imagery is referenced in 1 Kings and all of these other references you see. One, two, three, four, five, six different references. They chant the Qanke, the Onith al Qanke, when the deacon says, like, peace be with us, and then I go to the prayer before La Khumara. You chant that. And then, yeah, so peace be with us means you're moving to a whole other section. We kind of got through some of the introductory stuff. Now we're going to go to La Khumara. So the first part of Mass is preparational for the Zuyaha, that is the procession, to the Qurbana. This symbolizes our journey to earth, from earth, rather, that takes us to heaven. The procession is to the gospel. In the very early church, they faced the altar, and that was the east. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the light. And because Jesus said he would come again from the east. Medna hai sapra. That's a prayer that we pray every single morning. Medna hai sapra. It means um, at the dawning of the morning. Med dawning is refers, reference to east. The sun rises from the east. So it's always east, you know. Uh, if one cannot face the east, he faces the cross. Then the Shamasha says, Shlama Amman. He doesn't say, peace be with you, like in the Latin, right? He sings, peace be with us, right before the first prayer of the priest. This prayer very likely goes back to the first century. The Shamasha, in the name of everyone, to everyone, says, peace be with us. There's no response to this. The meaning of it is the opening. And the houses, okay, the same idea we're going to go over, we went over earlier. He's just telling everyone to be quiet. Okay? Be, be quiet before we read through Moses and the prophets. The people can listen. And this is in the very early church. Okay, turn the page. So the priest says this prayer. When the pleasant fragrance of your tender love embraces us, obviously that's a reference to incense that's about to take place. Uh, we are enlightened by your truth and may worthy to walk on the revelation of your beloved Son from heaven. So already at the beginning, the revelation or the return of your beloved Son, what's that in reference to? The second coming. So we're going to wait here, and we're waiting for your second coming, and we're doing what you told us to do until that time. Okay? Make us worthy to walk on the revelation of your beloved Son from heaven. That's what that's referencing. He's going to be coming again. So cover us with your pleasant love. The fragrance, because we stink. You guys smell that? Sin. There we will praise you in heaven unceasingly and glorify you in your crowned church. What's crowned church referred to? The end of time. The church will be crowned. So we're looking for the second to the end, from the beginning. When that prayer is decided, before that, there was a veil right here covering up the church. The sanctuary, rather. There was a, a veil is another word for like a curtain. Right here, where I'm standing. There's all this area will be covered up. Because you don't have access to the holy. 
Okay, we build up to that. We, we wake our way gradually closer and, and we get to see God revealed more and more. It's such a beautiful poetic movement. Um, the prayer over the incense, there is an actual prayer that the priest says for different times that the incense comes forward. And um, there's different prayers that show us what that is supposed to signify at that time. In this case, this has been removed. And a lot of these rubrics have been removed, by the way. Most of them have been removed in the current Mass. Uh, incense. In the name of your glorious Trinity, let this incense which we offer be for your blessed for your honor. Let it be pleasing to your will and for the forgiveness of the offenses of your people, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, forever. So in this case, um, the incense is being used for God's honor as well as the forgiveness of the people because we stink of sin. The deacon incenses the altar to the... He incenses the altar. Okay, normal, you guys see that. And then he incenses the bishop three times. One, two, three. Pay attention, servers. He incenses the bishop. One, two, three. He incenses the priest once. And then he goes down and incenses the church. Okay, so it's good to know. You guys, some of you incense me three times. That's technically it's supposed to be once. Bishop Francis, three times. Then the celebrant says to him, May Christ delight you in his kingdom and accept you in the ministry through the grace of his mercy. Altar three times. That's it. Uh-huh. I mean, if you incense from here to that side, it's technically going to the altar and the tabernacle, so it's fine. Yeah, you can do that, three, three, three. But this is it's just specifically pointing out how much to the bishop and the priest. Because it says you incense the altar, but it doesn't specify how much. Three, three, three is a good combination. And then the people pray as we went over it before. To you, O Lord of all, we thank. Okay? Um, so, the idea behind this prayer, um, there's speculation that it was probably an opening hymn to Mass. Now we have like, good morning, welcome to St. Thomas Church. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lekki Maha, and our celebrant is Abuna Shisma. You know, you can turn your books to page whatever, and we will sing, Here I Am, Lord, you know? So, um, in this case, La Khumara would be like the opening hymn. Everyone would know La Khumara. It's like a matter of fact. They'd have it tattooed on them. <laughs> they didn't have it tattooed. I was referenced to my last week's lecture. All right. Um, at the end of the second century, we have the first church in Edessa. Very probably Marmari came from here. The priest would say, Shlama Amman. Okay. So, La Khumara was used as an opening hymn, is what it's saying. The story of Marshall and Bar Sabai made this a standard. Adish Adaha came in about the 6th century for our liturgy, but for the rest of the church in Antioch, it was the 5th century. Okay, moving on. Uh, there's the prayers of Lachumara, just said three times. You have a question? So, why do some Chaldean churches say Lachumara twice and some say it? Three times. So we do say it three times here, but just one of the times is in English. So that prayer at the top of page 16, uh, page uh, 39, number 16, to you, Lord of all we think, that's La Khumara. So we do it um, in a lot of the churches in, in our diocese, in the Diocese of St. Thomas, the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, we start it typically in English. Not all churches, but we start it in a lot of the churches in English, and then we continue it and the Syriac and the Aramaic. And the reason for that is just because of catechetical purposes. Like I've been to Australia, and when I say the meaning of La Humara, nobody knows what it means. But you, if I say to you, Lord of all we think, you already get it. So it's just so we can have a com combination to understand what we're praying. So it's more for practical purposes of, of teaching. Yeah. But yes, uh, when I was in Chicago, we did it three times in, in Syriac. Yeah. Okay. Um, Moving on, number 21, let us pray peace be with us. We'll move from one subsection to another. The deacon incenses the people and enters the region of the deacons, the area of the deacons. So the priest reinforces the Lachumara by praying number 22. We go to Qadish Alaha. Okay. And then on page 32. 
Uh, there will be the first prayer after Qadisha Alaha, holy, glorious, mighty, and immortal, right? After that prayer, two Old Testament readings and a psalm uh, would be said. So both Old Testament readings and a psalm. One from Moses and from the prophets. And the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, right? these men who are walking, two men, and Jesus appears, they don't know it's Jesus, and he's like, why are you looking so gloomy? And like, have you not heard? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that didn't hear how Jesus was crucified? And then he said, oh, slow of heart, foolish of, uh, slow to believe and, and hard of heart. You know, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and so enter into his glory? And then it says in the first line, on page 41, underneath Amen, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So we go through Moses and the prophets. See how we're very biblical? At this point, two readings from the Old Testament are read, one from Moses, the Pentateuch, or the Torah, and one from the Apoph prophets. Following this is a reading from a psalm, and afterwards, a reading from the epistle of St. Paul. The reading from the apostle, a symbol of John's exalted words, John the Baptist, when he spoke to the crowds concerning our Savior, such as, He who has come from above all is above all. Along with the rest of such passages, I am not the Christ, but the one sent before him. So we do the person reading St. Paul's letter is an image of John the Baptist. You see uh, the footnote there at the bottom, number six. This is from Gabriel of Qatar's commentary on the liturgy. So the, he's like from the first, I think, sixth, sixth century or seventh century at the latest, Gabriel of Qatar. So he's already talking about like why, what that means at this point of the Mass, what it's representing. So that's like not my commentary, it's his. Okay. Uh, moving down near the end, the gospel that goes forth for the procession of the deacons is a symbol of procession which our Lord entered Jerusalem riding on a colt. The reading of the gospel is a symbol of all the words which our Lord spoke to the Jews before he suffered. More incense is used during the gospel. The sweet incense, basima, basma. Right, that's where it comes from, basima. This incense is so basima, bisma. Uh, at this moment, is a symbol of the sweetness of our Lord's words. What he said indicates, Come unto me, all you who are weary and carrying loads, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is basima, and my load is light. Again, learn from me, for I am restful and humble of heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. This is all Gabriel Fatar's commentary. It's all just on that part of the Mass. So beautiful. The readings of the day are read on the left side of the Bama. So that, um, technically, I believe that side. Um, and then the reader descends from the Beth Yachon and genuflects before the altar and is blessed by the bishop or the celebrating priest and chants, be seated and attentive, the book of Numbers, Barachmar. Okay. So again, the readings are read from the Bama, number 34. This prayer, number 34, was a silent prayer that was used to bless the first reader. Okay, now we say, may Christ enlighten with his teaching, make where the model for all who listens to you. You guys know that? So this was a different prayer that was said for the Old Testament reader. Blessed be God, the Lord of all, who bestows wisdom upon us by his holy teachings. May his mercies fall upon the reader and listeners at all times and forever. Does that sound familiar to some of you? Make us worthy, O Lord, with your teachings, enlighten us, that your knowledge, sanctify our souls by your truth, gather that we may be with your words and faithful as your commands at all times. Oh, that's not there. Sorry. That's somewhere else. But yeah, we don't have this prayer, actually, out loud anymore. Number 34. Or in the Mass at all. A lot of these rubrics are just not in the Mass anymore. FYI. A lot of these. If I had to stop for every single one that wasn't, we would be going over. Speaking of which. Okay. It's already 744. Okay. I don't know about you, but I'm having fun. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. So when the reader finishes, um, he just you know, transitions to the next part, transitions to the next part. The Shuraya, number 36, is typically taken from the Psalms. Uh, or at the bottom of page 42, uh, if it's a high feast day, like the birth of Jesus, or his baptism, Epiphany, or a feast of Our Lady, he says a specific um, 
formula for that. Okay, number 39. After the psalm is read, then the priest says, enlighten us, our Lord and our God. What we do in today's day is we say, both those prayers are holy, glorious, mighty, and immortal, and then enlighten us, and then both readings are said. Typically, it would be one and one. One for the Old Testament, and one for the initiating of the new. And then the letter of St. Paul is read, Barachmar. What does Barachmar mean? Uh, at times, it can mean that the deacon is asking for a blessing from the bishop or celebrant, or can refer to the people asking the celebrant for a blessing. It can also refer to the celebrant asking God or his brother priest for a blessing. It's depending on the context. Barachmar just means, bless me, Lord. So, like, you know, Lord Farquaad from Shrek. Lord doesn't necessarily have to refer to God. You can also refer to, like, a title of, like, you know, someone. Like, Lord, it's like a ma, amu. You know, it's like, sir. Bless me, sir. All right. To be consistent with the theme of the life of Christ, gave you of Qatar, here it is, early 7th century. Notice that the reader of the epistle represents John the Baptist. We've said that already. Okay. May Christ in line with his teaching, make way the model. And then he says at the end, Ushu halam shihamaran. You know, that's the end of the, the reading of the letter of St. Paul. And here are the prayers the priest says. The priest processes to the gospel. Before he gets up, he says, To who is the radiance of the image of the glory of the Father is manifested in our humanity and illuminated our ignorance by the light of his gospel. We confess, glorify, and honor, and glorify at all times, Lord of all forever. So first he acknowledges God. And then, as he's walking towards the gospel, he says, Glory to the everlasting mercy who has sent you to us, O Christ, who is the light of the world and the source of life to all forever. That was the gospel last week. John 8, 12, light of the world. Then he picks it up and he returns to his place. Make us wise, O Lord, with your teachings and lighten us with your knowledge. Sanctify our souls by your truth. This is the daily mass prayer. They just made it into, for some reason, like a reading before the letter and a daily mass. I have no idea what the logic was there, but there it is. There it is. Behold Sorry if my commentary is a little bit snarky. I don't want my personality to seep in too much. All right, prayer over the incense. Beautiful prayer. Such a gorgeous prayer. May the sweet smell which was emitted from you when the sinful Mary poured the fragrance upon your head mingle with this incense which we offer in your honor to be forgiven the sins of our trespasses. Uh, the Lord of all forever. What a beautiful imagery, huh? So again, hearkening to like this Saint Gabriel of Qatar said, we're hearing the sweetness of the words of God. Basim, you know, Basima. And Abisma is complimenting that. The words of Jesus are sweet and, and fragrant. Like the fragrance that the sinful Mary poured on Jesus. Mary, uh, either the sinful woman who poured oil on his head or, or his uh, Mary, the sister of Martha, I think she poured it on his feet, or is it vice versa? Thank you. Okay. And there we go. It says it on the top of page 45. I just comment on it, and then I look at it, and I go, yeah, I just said that. All right. Um, good. As the epistle is read, the deacon sings hallelujah, hallelujah, and then the deacons sing the gospel psalm. All the deacons would have typically said it, and then hallelujah. The same melody, they chant the following. Shalia. Uh, oh no, uh, be attentive and hear the Holy Gospel. Um, peace be with you. Oh, thank you. I was joking. All right, so uh, I, I didn't write anything. I, I should have. I should have. On, um, uh, see where it, four, it says 48. Above that, be attentive and hear the Gospel of the Lord. I should have wrote a number there. Because that's like similar to the part where you say Pshilia wa Washlau. Which, by the way, the Mass has changed so frequently since this Mass has come out that we're using right now that that part has actually been taken out for some reason. Um, but we're still praying it because it's, we don't know what else is going to change before we're going to change more. Uh, so we still use it in our diocese. In California, they don't. So Father Pierre was there recently, and he was waiting for the deacon to say Pshilia, and there was like silence for a good like seven seconds. He's like, are you going to say it? And then like, well, we don't say it here. <laughs> uh, but it's a funny word, because 
Shilia means in silence. What does ish mean? Ish means shut up, right? Just like shut up. Shut up, Shilia Hua was shlau. Shlau. So I just like telling everyone to shut up. <laughs> Be silent and in reverence. That's that's that we're pretty much telling you to be quiet in, a, in like a direct way. Because, you know, gospel's being read. So when you see me do my Saturday masses and I'm talking to the communion kids and they're all like moving around doing the gospel and then my eyes turn into laser beams and knives and I look at them while I'm reading the gospel and then they kind of go like this. That's why. All right, next page. <laughs> all right. Top of page 46. Continue with the image of the Mass moving through the life of Christ. The Gospel is read, and an explanation would be reminiscent of Christ's ministry and his message, his teachings. And then, after that, page number 54, petitions are brought forth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-3. through 3. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions be made. Okay, so he's just saying that we should be praying for kings, all who are in high positions, positions of the church, leaders of the community. Okay, some of these petitions correspond to the verses of the Byzantine liturgy, but now we've changed them to be updated every single week, which is a thousand times better. Instead of praying for an abundance of fruits, you know, in our backyard, you know, to have a lot of khiyar. Okay. So, um, I'm going to pause it on number 40, page 48, number 69, for a moment, uh, and see if you have any questions. Yes. Two questions. So why has the mass changed so much and has it affected the validity of the mass? Uh, so it has not affected the validity, I'll tell you that first. Uh, but it changed so much. I think there there is a practical need for change because if we were doing the Mass the entirety, it would take a lot longer. And as you know, just in this church alone, there's extreme issues with getting in and out of the parking lot. The way of life has changed so much that you can't just have a three-hour Mass uh, because people have work obligations and you're not, you're in a different world than before and you need to update that world. I get that. I think that's a very valid thing. Uh, but it's just a frequency... I don't know. I might give too many critiques in response to that. But um, obviously there isn't an agreement on how these changes are taking place, so that's why there's so many changes. So that's the sort of it. I hope that satisfies the answer. Louder, if you can. Do I think that the priest will ever go back to facing the cross instead of the people? Well, most, like I, I did Mass today with the, the convent, and I faced the cross. I do Mass for Sister Catherine the Hermit, and I faced the cross. Um, Father Stefan faces the cross. I'm not sure what the practice in California is. They face, it is, they do it like we do. It's a mix. But we've kind of put some prayers we do face the cross now at the beginning. Um, but I think I'm optimistic especially based on the um, opinions of our younger generation of priests who are by far majority on the same page that we um, prefer liturgically to be facing the East as a more proper posture or facing the cross, if not the East. So I'm optimistic about that hopefully changing one day, but I know that um, our patriarch is very vocally against it, ex excessively against it, excessively. Uh, to the point where one priest who, um, yeah, I won't come. Anything else? Yes. So what's the difference between the high mass and the daily mass? Um, so the differences would be, you know, there isn't much of rubrics that specify how there should be a difference. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is, again, because the daily mass became a more novel thing. There's options for, like, uh, feast um, memorial masses of, like, certain saints. But the differences would be in tone. 
there wouldn't be a standard tone for daily mass. It would be a modifiable tone. And uh, certain prayers that are more used for uh, Sundays and feast days would not be used. Instead, shorter, more moderate prayers. Um, but, and I believe that in practice, we, we, we only have one reading before the gospel. No psalm either. Um, between, you know, before the, the, the reading. We do have like a, a line, one-liner now, today's Mass, before the Gospel, but those would be the differences. Is Raza Rabba the same as Raza Vitaya? Uh, they're not synonymous. So Raza Rabba just means a high Mass, and that's celebrated on Sundays and uh, as the main Mass and on feast days. But Raza Vitaya is the third Eucharistic prayer, which is only prayed technically on five days of the year. Another question? The five days that we celebrate Lithaya can be found on page um, 57 and the commentary note at the end. Number one, the Feast of the Epiphany. Number two, the Feast of John the Baptist. Number three, Wednesday of Baotha. Number four, the Memorial of the Greek Teachers. And number five, Passover Thursday. Okay. Any other questions? Do you have one? Sure. This is an excellent comment that I want to repeat, okay? Um, the comment was that um, now that the theology and structure of why the priest faces the east or the cross is explained, it's much more readily um, understandable and accepted as opposed to the common comments, which is like, why is the priest turning his back to us? Which is a common objection. And um, I think you're right, it's not explained enough. And I think that, in my, for me, I'll tell you, because I'm able to speak, I can speak for myself. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about expressing it only because of the opinion of some of the superiors who are against it. So there's a little more of a hesitation, but as the times change and people change in positions, there's a little more acceptance uh, that's taking place towards that. Yeah. But I, I, I've heard the same thing that you said, which is why I read that. I think it's such a good quote. Pope Benedict addresses that, you know, directly. He's not taking turning to the people. They're facing the Lord together. It's a prayer through the priest. Any other question? Good. This might be the last question. So Pope Benedict grew up with the tradition of the church in the Tridentine Mass. Uh, where they would face the East, even to the point where, which in my opinion is a little too much, they face the East, or they face the cross when they were re reading the Gospel. Because it's like facing the wall. I mean, because they have to preach to the world. I mean, some things I think we should be facing. We're preaching, when I'm preaching and talking to you, I should be facing you, and I'm addressing you, you know? Uh, but Pope Benedict grew up with that tradition, and he was very sympathetic towards that tradition especially to the point where he made great headway with uh, those who were against Vatican II, say the Vaticanus, the say the, um, anyway, I uh, forgot the word, it escapes me. But um, he, he allowed them to start saying the Trinity Mass again, which has been reversed by Pope Francis, unfortunately. Uh, it's a very concerning reversal. We pray for him. Bless his heart. We pray for our Pope. Okay. Um, we're going to end it on that. And so um, next week what we'll talk about is some very interesting stuff. I will say that the more we progress through the Mass, the more we're going to progressively get deeper. And it's going to get more fun. And it's going to be very good spiritual food. This is the, the highlight of all these lectures of the next two weeks. You're going to get a lot of good spiritual food, okay? So let's look forward to that.
We'll give glory to God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit.